Abraham Joseph here once again. Wanted to talk to you today a little bit about the biblical health laws. You know, it's been amazing what man has accomplished in the last couple centuries. We as humans have done more on many accounts in the last, say, 150 years than we have in the previous 4,000. We spent men to the moon. We've built mass transportation systems. The common person can fly around the globe and economically. We visit places as tourists that explorers only traveled once in a lifetime. We've eradicated diseases that have plagued the planet. We've built communication systems where people can easily talk to someone on the other side of the planet and many times for free. Uh, modern machines and manufacturing techniques have dramatically increased the standard of living for billions. And especially in the area of agriculture where at one time it took over half the population uh, to feed ourselves just to avoid starvation, now only a small fraction can feed millions. And with these advancements, the life expectancy of the average person has just soared. In the middle of the 19th century, the life expectancy for the average male in the United States was only 40, whereas in today it's almost twice that amount. Infant mortality at the time was a staggering 46%. Today, it's only fractions of a percent. And so, what were the real advancements that saved so many lives? Well, Claire Nadine, uh, the Director of Communications at San Juan based in Public Health, had this to say. Over the last 200 years, the U.S. life expectancy has more than doubled to almost 80 years, with vast improvements in health and quality of life. However, while most people imagine medical advancements to be the real reason for this increase, the largest gain in life expectancy occurred between 1880 and 1920 due to public health improvements such as control of infectious diseases, more abundant and safer foods, cleaner water, and other non-medical social improvements. See, the real life-saving advancements of our modern era hasn't come from the laboratory or from a team of engineers. It's come through basic hygiene, quarantine, and sanitation. Many things we take for granted. According to Sarah Bosley, health editor at The Guardian uh, newspaper, she says this, sanitation is the greatest medical milestone of the last century and a half. And many other historians and uh, health professionals agree with this. Uh, Dr. V.W. Green, author of Cleanliness and the Health Revolution, says this in his book, and he's talking specifically about this first health revolution from 1880 to 1920. This period is actually referred to as the first public health revolution, and it occurred before medical interventions of antibiotics and advanced surgical techniques were in place. Historians have concluded that improved sanitation, public water treatment, sewage management, food inspection, and municipal garbage collecting almost eliminated the aforementioned causes of death. During a quarter of a century, 1890 to 1915, infant mortality rates declined significantly. During this time, magazine advertisements informed consumers of the hazards of contagions, as well as the rewards associated with cleanliness and beauty. Bathing gradually became a part of normative daily behavior. This socio-culture modification was followed by dramatic declines in infant diarrhea, the leading component of infant mortality in those years. Now, don't get me wrong, there's been some vaccines, not recently, but there's been some vaccines, antibiotics, advanced surgical techniques, drug treatments that have saved lives. But these health experts and historians are all saying in unison that the real advancements that saved by far the most lives was through the adoption of basic hygiene, quarantine, and sanitation. Because what many people forget is just how backward civilization was a mere 150 years ago. Bloodletting was a common practice. Hygiene and bathing was just something you did to get a date. The best guess that medical authorities had at the time for how diseases spread was spontaneous generation. It just popped up and nobody knew why. In 1799, when George Washington fell ill, the finest doctors in the area sprang into action and ran to his bedside to help him. And they knew exactly how to get that infection out of Washington. They drained out his blood. <laughs> in the next 10 hours, doctors drained out over half of his blood. And despite this life-saving treatment, 
uh, he died shortly afterwards. You know, we can joke about it, but that's how backward medical science was at the time. During the Civil War, it was very common practice for surgeons to use tools to cut away dead flesh that had been infected with gangrene and then use those same tools to per perform surgery on a new patient or victim, I guess, without washing anything. They would leave the tools out all night, let the flies do their thing, not wash anything, and then resume surgery in the next morning on the next victim. And then be completely surprised why the gangrene just keeps spreading from patient to patient. According to J.J. Lewis of the U.S. Sanitary Commission, during the Civil War, soldiers' lack of basic hygiene may have been deadlier than bullets or bayonets. For each soldier who died on the battlefield, two more died of disease. Filthy living conditions, along with the lack of knowledge about germs and bacteria, caused thousands of soldiers to get sick and die. Many doctors were just as unhygienic as their patients. And as we're going to see, many attempts to try and get doctors to practice basic hygiene was met with huge opposition. In the mid-19th century, Hungarian doctor Ignaz Samuel Weiss was shocked by the unusually high amount of infant mortality rate of mothers who gave birth to hospitals as compared to those who gave birth at home. It was about 10 to 20 times higher. He himself had a much higher mortality rate than those who gave birth to midwives. So he began studying their techniques, their birthing positions, and questioning them until finally he realized that it had something to do with all of those autopsies he was performing <laughs> right before he delivered his babies. You know, who'd have thunk it? So after this discovery, he mandated that all the doctors wash their hands in between procedures and the death rate fell dramatically. However, the doctors in Vienna, uh, because of the politics at the time, who would have thunk politics had anything to do with medical science, but, you know, it did. But uh, these uh, doctors were outraged at the thought that they were the cause of their patient's illness, and he met, was met with enormous resistance and criticism until he lost his clinical appointment, appointment at the Vienna Hospital in uh, Hungary in 1850. Then he took a position at St. Rokas Hospital in Budapest, where he had similar results. He was able to lower the infant mortality rate down to from 15% to less than 1%, which is very similar to today's numbers. In 1861, he published his findings in medical journals. But the more and more he told the medical community of how sanitation and hygiene was important for medical practices, the more he was met with intense criticism and till later he fell into a depression in 1865 and was committed to an insane asylum and then he died several weeks later. That's really how backward and political the medical community was 150 years ago. And it really wasn't until the work of Florence, Florence Nightingale did health officials at large become to notice the importance of hygiene, sanitation, and quarantine. Uh, Florence Nightingale had taken a post as a new nursing superintendent in London in 1853. And the following year, she went to serve in the Crimean War in Constantinople, where she was just appalled by the lack of sanitation uh, there in uh, their war effort. Ten times as many soldiers died from disease and from battle wounds. She, uh, after exhausting all the normal channels through the government to get help, she then uh, sent a plea to the London Times where they were able to get the attention of the government. They immediately they sent her a prefabricated hospital and a team from the Sanitary Commission. She then implemented hand washing, spacing beds a, me a minimum of three feet apart, increased ventilation, removal of the horses from the infirmary, who, who'd have thunk it, um, cleaning out the sewers, disinfecting the, the restrooms with peat moss and charcoal. And within six months, the mortality rate from disease fell from 42%, over 42%, to 2.2%. Dramatic reduction. And because of her great success and meticulous documentation, she was able to significantly influence the British medical community on her return. But the full adoption of these life-saving techniques did not come until after the discovery of germs in 1870 by French chemist and microbiologist Louis Pasteur. See, Pasteur, who 
had been studying yeast in the fermentation process and coupled with the large improvements in microscopes, in the middle of the 19th century, he was able to identify what is exactly was causing beer and wine to spoil. Uh, and he found out it was germs, microorganisms, bacteria. He then coined the pasteurization process to kill these organisms. And with the discovery of bacteria, he was, uh, was able to not only disprove spontaneous generation, but he was also able to show under the microscope how contamination takes place by bacteria, microorganisms, and viruses. And these discoveries, according to Lee Ligon, PhD of Bayer College of Medicine, by Pasteur, laid the foundation for hygiene, public health, and much of modern medicine today. But despite what many people think, it was not until these discoveries by Ignaz Samuel Weiss, Florence Nightingale, Pasteur, and other scientists in the late 19th century, accompanied with advanced micro advancements in microscopes where they could visually see and confirm that in fact it was bacteria, germs, and microorganisms that were causing diseases, how these uh, organisms spread from one person to the other. It wasn't until this time that it was common knowledge by any stretch of the imagination that hygiene, quarantine, and sanitation was important or should be practiced at all. Much of that was stripped from modern society because of anti-Semitism and because of the rise of the Catholic Church during the Middle Ages. For instance, in Norway, where they had battled with leprosy for hundreds of years, and unsuccessfully, they had no consensus on what the cause or preventative measures or treatments should be followed uh, for leprosy. They didn't isolate lepers. And then in the late uh, 1700s, when leaders were just exasperated by another new epidemic of leprosy, they did the unthinkable. Hold on to your seats there. <laughs> they followed those old Jewish biblical laws in Leviticus 13 to isolate lepers and force them to live away from others until they were cured of their disease. By the 1800s, leprosy, the leprosy epidemic was again under control. But you know, you really couldn't prove that it was a communicable disease and those Jews, what did they know? That's all Old Testament. It's been nailed to the cross. And so once again, they relaxed the rules and no longer required lepers to live in isolation. Lepers were even given the opportunity to live a normal life amongst others. Norwegians even allowed them to specialize in door-to-door -door sales. Isn't that great? Because, you know, if you didn't let them in your house, you were probably a bigot or a Semite or, you know, worse, you know. And so, once again, the, the, the diseases flared out of control, and it wasn't until 1873 when Dr. Gerard Hansen, at the Lagarde's Hospital in Bergen, where he, like Pasteur, was able to visually see the bacteria on a slide and was only then able to convince the medical community that the disease was spread from person to person. It wasn't until this time did they, did they once again enforce quarantine with those who were infected. Over the next 60 years, virtually no one was reinfected with leprosy and Norway's population of lepers dropped from almost 3,000 to less than 70. All of these techniques that were adopted during the first public health revolution, all of them, whether we're talking about sanitation, quarantine, hygiene, washings, sterilization of either clothes or utensils, they are all outlined in God's law, His Torah, 3,400 years before the microscope. And as we go through some of these biblical health laws, we're going to see clearly that not only did the author of these laws understand microbiology, but that author was the creator God. You know, one of the biggest problems with hospitals and wartime hospitals alike prior to the 20th century was the diseases spread like wildfire. And this was the primary killer that Ignaz Samuel Weiss and Florence Nightingale fought against. It was the primary killer in, in the Civil War. All of the life-saving techniques that they discovered and more are described in Numbers 19, Leviticus 11, and Leviticus 15. And when you read these three chapters, you're going to see clearly that there's some very specific procedures on dealing with anyone or anything that came in contact with an infection. 
whether it be a, someone who was sick or they had a rash or an infected wound or some kind of oozing uh, wound in their arm or wherever, especially, and especially if someone died, the restrictions were even more. And if you came in contact with contagions, well, how do you resolve the problem? Well, they had the answers. What's also very interesting is how the Bible has these very uh, interesting distinguishments between each case and evaluates each case a little bit differently. And it makes sense, as we know uh, later on, through the study of uh, germs and uh, microorganisms. And as we go through these different situations, the glaring question arises is how did the author of the Torah, the Law of Moses, how was he able to make these distinctions without being acutely aware of microbiology and how diseases spread? And when we realize there's absolutely no way they could have known these of, and made these distinctions without knowing uh, much about microbiology and the spread of diseases, how did they get this information 3,400 years before microscopes, laboratories, medical trials, case studies? Well, when we look at Leviticus 11, it gives very specific procedures on after someone touches the carcass of an animal. They were to be unclean and they were to wash themselves and their clothes in running water. And they were to remain unclean until the following day. And if someone came in contact with a dead person, well, these procedures even got more stringent. Numbers uh, 19, 14 describes what to do if someone died in their tent. Everything in the tent, if it wasn't covered up or if it didn't have a lid on it, was now unclean for seven days. If there was a lid on the vessel, um, it was okay. But if there was no lid, that vessel was unclean and had to be washed. Any person or bowl or vessel or anything that came in contact with the dead person or was in the tent was now unclean for seven days. It had to be washed in ash water or lye. And uh, as Florence Nightingale showed that this ash water has been found to be an excellent disinfectant. Um, it's very caustic, has a very high pH level. Another natural antiseptic is hyssop. And in the procedures in Leviticus, this ash water was to be applied with the hyssop bundle. And hyssop is the active ingredient in many of mouthwashes today. It kills bacteria. And all these procedures make complete sense if you understand microbiology and how contagion spread. Leviticus 11, verse 28. Whosoever carries such carcass shall wash his clothes and be unclean till evening. It is unclean to you. Anything on which any of them falls when they are dead shall be unclean, whether it's any item of wood or clothing or sin or sack, whatever item it is in which any work is done, it shall be put into water, it shall be unclean until evening, then it will be clean. You got to let it wash it and let it set aside till the next day. Any earthen vessel on which any of them falls, you shall break it. You know, as we know, pottery is very porous, and it gets in the pores, you got no choice. You can't get it out, you have to break it. In any such vessel, any edible food upon which it falls shall now become unclean. If you get it, something dead falls on your food, you got to throw it away. Makes sense if you understand microbiology. If you don't, we didn't figure it out th until 3,400 years later. Any drink that may be drunk now becomes unclean makes perfect sense and everything on which part of any such carcass falls it shall be unclean whether it is an oven or cooking stove it shall be broken down for they are unclean it shall be unclean to you and so once again um, these are life-saving techniques if you have unglazed pottery or a clay brick oven it's porous something gets in there and dies, you're not going to be able to get that bacteria out of it. You need to break those items. You can't reuse them. If you understand microbiology, all these statutes make complete sense and save lives. And many of these procedures are described again in Leviticus 15, only now it describes any type of infection, open wound that has an oozing discharge, maybe a rash or something like that that's broken out. And so think about it. Almost all the things that the medical community were doing wrong, that by far were killing the most people uh, prior to the health revolution, would be illegal in God's law. 
putting two sick soldiers in the same tent, illegal. Letting the same doctor cut up a dead body and then come near anyone, let alone a patient, illegal. Not washing everything between patients, illegal. And in Leviticus 15:11, uh, it makes it clear it'd be illegal for a doctor or his tools or anything that work is which to be done, use that on a patient with an infection and then come near another patient until he had washed everything and quarantined himself for a minimum of one day. Leviticus 11:15, whosoever he who discharges touches and has not rinsed his hands in water and washed his clothes, he shall bathe in water and he shall be unclean until sunset. And an earthen vessel on which he discharged touches shall be broken, and every vessel of wood shall be rinsed in water. Now this is a very interesting statement. Um, unglazed pottery um, that this infection, this contagion gets in contact with is to be broken. Makes perfect sense. It's porous, it gets in there, you can't get it out, you're going to have to break it. It's going to possibly save your life. But a wooden bowl, well, it's kind of porous too, and the bacteria could get into it, so I don't understand why a, you know, a, a, a pottery bowl that's porous has to be broken, but a wooden bowl is okay, it can just be washed and set out over, overnight. How does that make any sense? Well. In 1993, microbiologists from the University of Wisconsin Food Research Institute were studying which was more sanitary, wooden cutting boards or plastic cutting boards. And what they did is they contaminated both wooden boards and plastic ones with multiple strains of bacteria that cause food poisoning. And guess what? Without washing them, without touching them, with any kind of antibacterial put on them, the, wooden cutting, the bacteria on the wooden cutting boards died off in a matter of minutes. But on the plastic ones, they actually multiplied overnight and kept going. And what they discovered is that there are natural oils, tannins, turpentine in wood that has a natural bacteria killing property that plastic and glass cutting boards don't. And so, once again, how is it that Moses understood enough about microbiology to make these distinctions thousands of years ago? He didn't have a lab, didn't have a team of scientists, he didn't have microscopes. How did he figure this out? Well, one crazy theory is that, you know, he learned it from the Egyptians. Yeah, that's where he got it from. You know, the Egyptians were these great builders, they built these big monuments and canal systems and structures. They probably, Moses probably learned it from them. Even though these same people don't believe that the Israelites came from Egypt anyway, but you know, whatever. But just, just go with me on this, okay? Well, the fact is, when it came to medicine, the Egyptians were even more backward than Europe was during the Middle Ages. Many of these Egyptian remedies and treatments are described in the Papyrus Ebers. It was written around 550 BC, right before the time of Moses. And the Papyrus Ebers is the oldest and most extensive medical record ever found. It's, and it, it's like 68 feet long. It contains over 800 spells and enchantments. And this is what B.B. Uh, B. Wagner, anthropologist, uh, has to say about the Papyrus Eberts. During this time, there was a very strong association with magic, religion, and medical health being one holistic experience. There was no concept of bacterial or viral infections, only the spite of the gods. And that's what we see if you want to read some of these spells. They're available online, the translation is. And some of the treatments were pretty benign, but others are downright deadly. This, this one I was looking at gave a great remedy for if you have an infected splinter, right? So you make this ointment, and it's a mixture of uh, worm blood and donkey dung. Sounds great, you know? If, if the uh, infection wasn't already there, the tetanus will for sure get in the second time after you put the ointment on, and you're going to forget all about any other problems you have, right? <laughs> Uh, another great cure that I was checking out was uh, you got a colicky baby, crying too much, want to put the baby to sleep. Well, there's this great concoction you can make from the Egyptians. What you do is you go and you scrape all the fly dung off the wall, right, you know, fly crap, and you stick it into some with some water and mix it up so it's nice coffee colored, and then feed that to the baby. 
and you know, she's not, the colickiness is just going to go away. The crying is going to stop in no time flat, right? After she pukes it up. But uh, the bottom line is, is the Egyptians had absolutely no concept of microbiology, let alone sanitation, quarantine, hygiene, what's unclean and what's clean. Uh, and many of the medical treatments of the ancient world were in direct opposition to God's health laws and modern medical science. These health laws listed in the Bible were given to Israel by someone who had far advanced medical knowledge before any of the rest of the planet. I mean, just look at the Middle Ages and with the Black Death. It was caused by a lack of sanitation, hygiene, and it killed almost a third of Europe. The biblical health laws would have prevented all of that. The author of the Torah had understanding of microbiology thousands of years before the rest of the planet. And that person was no other than God himself, the creator. Look at uh, Leviticus 11, verse 37. It gives instructions on what to do if your grain that you stored up gets contaminated by a dead animal. Growing up on the farm, we'd have this happen quite a bit. Uh, a rat climbs into the bin of grain and dies in there. Very common problem. And it says in Leviticus 11.37, If any part of such carcass falls on any planting seed which is to be sown, it remains clean. Makes sense. You're not eating it. You're going to put it in the ground. May even provide some fertilizer. However, he says, If water is put on the seed and any part of that carcass on it falls, it becomes unclean to you now. Now notice these distinctions. Very interesting. If a dead carcass falls on your planting seed, which hasn't been germinated, no problem. You're eventually going to eat the plant, not the seed. Not a big deal. But now that grain is only good for planting, not for eating. You can't eat the grain that the rat got into. Rat dies in your bag of grain, no problem. You don't have to throw it out, but you have to use it for planting. But if the rat dies in your corn mash batch for your whiskey, um, or there's a dead worm in your apple or a slug in your corn. It's now unclean, has to be thrown away. And all this makes perfect sense if you understand microbiology. Um, but keep in mind, the rest of the planet didn't understand any of this or the germ theory until they could visually see the process under a microscope. How did Moses understand this? Leviticus 15 has some very practical and very effective instructions on how to prevent the spread of diseases. Where if you have any kind of a rash or pox or wound or discharge, you're to stay away from others and thoroughly wash yourself and anything else that gets contaminated. Leviticus 15, 13. And when he who discharges is cleansed of his discharge, he shall number seven days for himself for cleansing, to wash his clothes, to bathe his flesh in running water, and he shall be clean. Notice running water. And in my second video, we're going to talk a little bit about the process, the self-purification process of running water versus stagnant water. And this running water, you're going to see, is very interesting. We'll talk about it next time. But he was to wash himself in running water, not in a tub of recycled water or some stagnant pond. The doctors in Hungary that fought Samuel Weiss, sure, they washed their hands in a community bowl they kept using over and over again throughout the day, basically a Petri dish. No, the biblical instructions were to wash yourself in running water. Big difference when we're talking about disease control. And there are far too many of these examples for me to fit in a 30-minute video. As I mentioned, I'm going to be working on a part two in short order, and we're going to talk about how to deal with black mold in homes, the self-purification process of running water, instructions not to eat blood, not to eat the fat, uh, not to eat an animal that dies on its own, the command to bury, bury your sewage when you go outside the tent, uh, as well as the well-documented benefits of circumcision, and a lot more. But as we look at these specific life-saving instructions that were given to the Israelites that greatly exceeded any medical knowledge that the planet had for another 3,000 years or more, there are some very obvious conclusions that we should, we should acknowledge them. First of all, the Torah, the law of Israel, was given none other by the Creator Himself. He and only He had the insight to understand uh, the secrets of life and to pass those secrets on to man. No other civilization in the world until the late 19th century, with the aid of the microscope, had this knowledge. 
The second takeaway is that God's law hasn't been done away with. It hasn't been nailed to the cross. As Yeshua said on the Sermon of the Mount, not one jot or tittle of law has been done away until heaven and earth have been passed away. And if you don't believe this, then you should all, by all means, go and break all these uh, biblical health laws I just mentioned. I mean, why not uh, eat food that had a dead rat fall into it or drink something that got contaminated? Or better yet, lick your fingers after your next autopsy. That law has been done away with. It's been nailed to the cross. So go ahead and break it all you want. You know, <laughs> go down to the infectious ward of your local hospital and give everyone there a big hug and kiss. And when they ask, what are you doing? Just tell them, hey, listen, God's law has been done away with and I've been freed from the penalty. So I'm immune. I'm not going to get sick. Well, that's what they did for over a thousand years in Europe. And during the Black Plague, it worked really great for them. And all that washing and bathing, uh, that's all Jewish. You're not keeping that old Jewish sanitation hygiene laws, are you, right? Yeah, try that on your next date. A third big takeaway from this is that God's law applies to everyone. The immutable laws of microbiology couldn't care less whether you're a Jew, a Gentile, male, female, black or white. It makes no difference. Because there is a belief amongst many Jews and Messianic Jews and Christians that God's law, the Torah, has only been required to be kept by the descendants of Israel. So if you're not an Israelite, it doesn't apply to you. So uh, diseases don't apply to me. Sanitation doesn't apply to me. Oh, I know I can go out and eat a dead rodent that carries just about every disease on the planet, and you're not going to get sick because I'm not an Israelite, right? I'm, I'm, I accepted the love of Jesus or whatever. You know, it's ridiculous. God's law applies to everyone. Brethren, the biblical health laws as shown in Scripture are overwhelming proof that there is a God in heaven that not only inspired the Bible, but He wants the best for you. He wants you to be healthy and live a long and prosperous life. He wants you to have abundance. He wants you to be fruitful and multiply, to see your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren. He wants to bless you. He wants you to be free from the penalties of sin as well, but not through disregarding His law and breaking His laws wherever you get a chance. He's not going to supernaturally come in and, and uh, protect you from the effects of breaking the health laws. But He wants you to be free from the penalties through obeying Him and keeping His statutes and commandments that He may help you to prosper in all that you do and wherever you may go. Thank you.